This is the Nightshade Cult, a podcast macabre. We bid you welcome. Enter freely and of your own will. I'm Nick Grimm. And I'm David Graves. We will be your horror hosts for this dissection of Ridley Scott's 2017 cosmic gothic horror, Alien Covenant. Good evening. So I'd never seen this before. Me neither. Okay, it's I thought really you had. interesting. I yeah. thought I had too, and yeah. then I, when I got into it, I started. I was like, no, I don't. I haven't seen this, and I went and looked. And if I did see it, I've forgotten it. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't know what it is that made me fall away from interest in this series. Mm-hmm. Uh, like as they've been, re, you know, releasing new movies throughout yeah. the years. I, I guess I generally don't like prequels. Yeah. I almost prequels always... Prequels are always a hard sell. I like things to be sequential. I like them to be... Uh, I like them to be of... Uh, I guess I would call it a cohesive vision. Mm-hmm. I don't like multiple directors, multiple writers. I don't yeah. like IP football. Yeah. Because you get that, that too many cooks in the kitchen, mm-hmm. uh, story by committee feeling... Um, but yeah. this is this is the master himself, so it's uh, you know that's that's good. Yeah, it is. It's and it's interesting. Um, I don't know. I know that it didn't have. It had mixed reviews, mm-hmm. um, and you know, so did Prometheus, which yes. uh, which I liked, and so I don't know why. I listened to the reviews for this one and not to the ones it, for Prometheus. Exactly. I thought the same thing. Like I. I probably didn't see this because of the the reviews or maybe mm-hmm. I saw it and I didn't remember it. I will say this even as much as I am a proponent of going and seeing movies in the theater, uh if I watch it at home I definitely don't pay as close of attention to it when you're watching at home. Yeah. Yeah, it is I mean that's the that's the thing in the the theater um you know unless you're a, a real dick knob there's no phones. Yeah, you, you, you don't you get really your phone, shouldn't. You don't get your phone out. You're really engaged in the movie in a way that you can't do at home because yeah. cause at home it's just too easy to to walk away. Do you know like mm-hmm. oh you know I'm gonna pause this and go get make popcorn or whatever. Yeah, I mean I did end up having to pause this to go do something and then yeah. come back to it, um, which which definitely interrupted the flow. But I will say it was in the first act, so yeah. it hadn't really picked up yet. But as regarding like stats on this, mm-hmm. it uh, it was made for. I don't know why they give a range of how much they spent on it, but it was mm-hmm. 97 to 111 million. So right around 100 million. Mm-hmm. And it, it uh, grossed 240 at the box office worldwide. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, it, but not as good as Prometheus. Not it, quite as good as Prometheus, yeah. and, which had got uh, over 400. Yeah. So Prometheus like quadrupled its money, and this did like two and a half times its money. Yeah, because there was supposed to be one more. Uh, movie at least in this prequel trilogy yeah. and this movie did not do well enough to get that made yeah and Ridley Scott has famously said that he will keep making alien movies he's not done with the story he may be done with this one linear thing yeah but he's not st- done storytelling in this world yeah I mean he's clearly got places to go in this mm-hmm. and I think maybe he found an outlet for that in other places like Raised by Wolves and Yeah, for sure. To continue exploring those ideas. I don't know if we're gonna see what exactly David gets up to when we leave him and, and the surviving crew members spoiler. of the Covenant. <laughs> That's a, this is a spoiler. Yeah, podcast. yeah, we're pro yeah. spoilers here. Yeah, I I, I was really I, I would say that um there were the the plot line of Prometheus was very simple and very linear. This is also very simple but it's more interesting. Like you think the so? the plot okay. line is more interesting here. I'm much l- less on this movie than Prometheus. I like Prometheus a lot. I'm not more. I'm not saying that I like this better than Prometheus. Okay. I think that the there is more more interest in uh, like like with the whole David Walter interplay and yeah. the twist at the end mm-hmm. where uh, David takes over Walter. So if you if you are listening to us and you haven't seen this movie, uh, that was the the twist that got spoiled for me uh, listening to the Empire podcast the uh, other day when they're like, you know how in Prometheus. Uh, David replaces Walter, and I was like, I was just about to watch that. <laughs> yeah, so we just talked, to, if you listen to the last episode, uh, Prometheus has the the android, the synthetic human that mm. is David, played by Mac- Michael Fassbender. He 
makes off into the stars with Elizabeth, right? That's her name? Uh, yes, and, at the end of Prometheus. Yeah, in yeah. the stolen starship, mm-hmm. and that's the, that's the end of that movie. And then we, then this new ship, um, the, the Covenant, the Covenant mm-hmm. has a new synthetic human named Walter. And mm-hmm. Walter is an upgrade of David. He's got newer yeah. tech. He's, but David has been brewing while he's away. He's become <laughs> evil. Yeah. <laughs> it, Differently, differently David, moral. Yeah, I was gonna say David was actually evil in Prometheus, yeah. so he he just got uh, he just got deeper into it. He became a bit of a Frankenstein, yeah, he's guy, Doctor Frankenstein. He's had like ten years to Frankenstein slash Reanimator around. Yeah. On, on uh, in his dire necropolis, as he calls it, and we learned from prequels and whatnot that Elizabeth fixed him and yeah. did uh prequels like the youtube videos yes there was um two the, fully like ridley scott made little vignettes yeah well his son luke, luke oh what were they uh, made luke by directed son? them yeah oh, okay cool um and luke directed some of the shorts around blade runner 2049 all right well um, hopefully he picks up the baton and continues i think so i think he's a solid filmmaker i'll i'll go out so far as to say that the last supper short has more characterization for those characters than this whole movie does. It was really good. Yeah, like I watched it and I was like, I get more of a sense of who all of these people are and how they relate to each other Mm -hmm. than watching this two hour plus movie. Yeah, this is a really interesting, uh, this is a really interesting movie because Mm -hmm. the villain isn't an alien. Yeah. The villain is David. Well, Um, is is David... I think David is the protagonist of this trilogy of movies. He okay. He he definitely is he, the main perspective character. I'm yeah. not sure he's he's a protagonist in any way. Okay. He uh, he might be a, a like, like some th- sort like, of antihero. Like I Thanos know. is the protagonist of uh, Infinity War. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, this is this is about David, and uh-huh. and so it's. That's good and that's bad because yeah. we can we can relate to him more. Mm-hmm. He has lots of issues. He's he's basically a human. He's resentful. He's, uh, he he has a lot of dark. Uh, he has a lot of dark inner monologue. He does. He's full incel. Oh you know yeah, I mean? yeah, like yeah. he's very he's sexually frustrated and mad at at the universe and um, getting his revenge. He's like. Yeah, it's he's like an incel terrorist, and, and so you can you can see you can relate to him more than you can relate to the alien hive queen. Yeah, which has uh, no personality. Yeah, really. none at all. And so you're just like, whoa, that's cool, that's scary. Ah, I mean, I love that monster. That's yeah. like my favorite, one of my favorite movie monsters of all time. Yeah, uh, but that's why this movie is has a little more intrigue and uh-huh. a little less just straight up uh monster in the house yeah. horror movie like aliens yeah did. so i realized today that i'm not um plugged into the alien uh fandom in the way i am into like say star wars or marvel or some mm-hmm. other things that i follow um because i started uh checking out this podcast called um uh, perfect organism that's mm-hmm. a, that's an alien podcast cool and i found out through that podcast that this movie basically broke the alien fandom and had people at each other's throats like oh. the, pe- the people people loved it or hated it and got real nasty with each other about it you know like in that sort of internet death threat kind of way where people go really extreme if you like this then you deserve to die and you know like i never understand that because like if we came in here and you were like i hate this this is garbage and i was like i love this we'd be like let's talk about why yeah exactly that (laughs) i mean that is the emotionally mature healthy response to the i mean also we're both movie enthusiasts so we're just gonna want to talk about it but like yeah i don't why why would you care what someone else thinks yeah I don't know. I don't know. So I was completely unaware yeah, of, I was unaware of how of toxic too. the reaction to this movie was. Um, it, that just blew me right by. So I was kind of going back and living it after the fact, where like the podcast host is like, please don't send me death threats. This isn't necessary. <laughs> and it's like, wow, people really got that twisted up about this. Yeah, that's absolutely ridiculous. I don't think the movie is that exciting one way or the other to get that worked up about it. I really liked this movie. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's the best alien movie in the franchise. Um, 
but it's pretty good. It's definitely a worthy addition. It's middle of the pack, right? Yeah, like it's, it's doing fine. It's better than um, either of the Aliens versus Predator movies. Yeah, and then what's that one where they tried to do kind of like this weird? I don't know. It's like a weird A team ish vibe, like like a bunch of mercenaries. It was one of those ones that takes place after the original trilogy, and it's maybe I don't, I don't know, even know. Maybe it's Resurrection. I don't know. Where they know. clone Ripley and. Has Winona Ryder. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, this is better than Resurrection. Oh, yeah. Dude, like, by a lot. So, uh, I don't know why people would hate on it. It's yeah. not, it's certainly not Aliens, which I think is probably the best one. I think... Alien is great. Alien Aliens. and Aliens are both, um, I mean, spoiler for our next episode, but I think those are both perfect films. Yeah, like, uh, I was watching a whole bunch of... Uh, uh, interviews uh, mm-hmm. of you know that came out because this came out in 2017. Mm-hmm. So of course there's tons of YouTube t- content yeah. around it, and Ridley Scott did a lot of talking. And he's not afraid of technology or the internet. Like mm-hmm. he loves to make online social media content. And, yeah, and he loves to talk about himself. And some guy, this one reporter was kind of fanboying. They, uh-huh. It's kind of weird. I don't know. I don't like it when they fanboy. But anyway, he was like, so knowing what you know now, and if you had all the technology that you have now and all the experience that you have now, what would you do different if you ma- if you were to re- if you were making Alien again? He said, nothing. It's a perfect film. Yeah. <laughs> that was... Um, that Absolutely was the, perfect. The same thing Paul Verhoeven said about RoboCop when he was asked that same question, what would you do different? And he's like, nothing. It's a perfect film. Like There there I, are some films that are like that. I love, and um, Ridley Scott, in the kind of run-up to Napoleon last year, was on Mark Maron's podcast. Mm-hmm. And like he's the biggest fan of himself <laughs> in a way that... Um, somehow comes off it's somehow charming even though it's so arrogant where he's like every time he's like he's like oh gladiator that's another great film i made and yeah. like and he just like he's he's so proud of his body of work and mm-hmm. and i just i like that about him that I think it's cool if you have things that you can be proud of mm-hmm. and you genuinely like them mm-hmm. um so yeah i mean i I had a I had a reason to go back and I listened to every Barrow Lands and every Mary Shelley album and unreleased recordings on yeah. my hard drives. And I was genuinely a fan of all of it. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not gonna be like like That's Ridley another Scott, great album I who's, made. He's like who's like, it's a perfect album. No, <laughs> yeah. no, no. It's like I like this song. Yeah. You know, I think it's cool if you like your art. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's good. That's a good thing. You should make art that you like. I, I I don't think that's going out on a limb. Yeah. No, I <laughs> and I think um I think that's what makes these like an auteur director, even if you don't one hundred percent love every everything that they make. Um, it's always worth watching a Ridley Scott movie, no, mm-hmm. ma- no matter what, just because he's such a singular visionary of a director. Yeah, he's probably my favorite director. If um, his, his, you know, Blade Runner is my favorite movie yeah. of all time. So you know, he he's right up there. So it's a real pleasure to watch his his work. Cool. Well, we've rambled for yeah, a bit. Yeah, it's we, quite a bit. We take our take a, a quick break. When a deep space colonizing mission is forced to make an unplanned repair stop, they intercept a mysterious transmission that leads them to a planet that seems ideal for their needs. Unfortunately for them, they are not the first travelers from Earth to reach this planet. This is a this is a really interesting beginning uh, to the movie mm-hmm. because they they start off at, they they stop they have there's like a solar storm or something like that whatever yeah. it was some whatever is sci-fi it, a, MacGuffin a new, new, neutrino flare is yeah what they whatever say. and they hear weird radio static and it's somebody singing and yeah. it, it's uh and, and John Denver Country Roads <laughs> yeah and and so they decide they need to investigate it and they find this perfect planet and you know obviously pro spoilers this is where David and Elizabeth made it to yeah and this was a world filled with engineers yeah it was like a temple world yeah so they went to paradise mm-hmm. um which 
it's unclear if this is their home world or if it's one of their seed planets or whatever. We don't mm-hmm. really elaborate it on it, but it is the planet they called paradise. Like it's, yes. it's like an, an, it's a utopia place. Um, and that's why it's ideal for human habitation as well. Because we share 100% DNA. Yeah, the, we are their creation. We're their, their genetic offspring, and um, their needs are our needs and vice versa. Um, and it's it mirrors the opening to Pre- Prometheus in a lot of ways, interesting mm-hmm. ways. You immediately get to know Walter has a very different personality than David. He's less fussy. Mm-hmm. You know, like he's... Um, just a different, a completely different character, even though it's the same actor and the same body. Yeah, and one one of those uh, interviews I was watching uh, with uh, Michael Fassbender, they mm-hmm. had, the interviewer asked, like, how did you differentiate uh, how you were going to play these characters and yet still have them both be believable as, like, uh, synthetic humans or whatever, mm-hmm. um, but in different ways? And so... Uh, he said that he worked it out with Ridley Scott. They they sort of workshopped it, and the mm-hmm. idea was, uh, you know, David he had really been leaning in on a Lawrence of Arabia impression. Yeah, it really he's that Peter O'Toole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the very posh and English sort voice. of fastidious yeah. fellow. And he said he wanted Walter to be like an American. Yeah, so, he does have an American accent, and he's more relaxed about things in general. Hoodie up most of the time. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. So I thought that was really interesting how they, you have the kind of the posh casual fascist and then a chill <laughs> American. <laughs> Walter definitely seems like more of a bro because Walter, we find out, is uh, he's a reaction to the David model, which people were very uncomfortable with because it yeah. was too human and a little too like asked uncomfortable questions. Yes. And wasn't happy with his lot in life. Whereas Walter's. Uh, He's happy if you're happy. Like, Walter's there mm-hmm. to help. Yeah, there are a couple of moments. Like, There's a Walter commercial. Have you watched, watched no, that? No, I don't yeah, think the so. Yeah, the Walter commercial's pretty good, too. I wouldn't mind having a Walter hanging around. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, I mean, it seems like... a. It seems very good to have a Walter around. I mean, maybe in the future when we're like extreme senior citizens, we, uh-huh. you can purchase a unit, like a care unit that, yeah, you know, that just looks take after care you. of you. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a smart thing to do. Yeah. Why not get a Walter? That, that, that would be my choice. Over the David. I like the David quite a bit as a character, but not as someone to watch over me. Yeah. No, I don't <laughs> trust the David. Yeah. So this movie, um, long path. The many hands on this script. Okay. Um, starts out, uh, Jack Peglin does the initial graph, or draft. It goes over to Michael Green. It goes um, finally uh, to, well, no, not finally. It goes to Dante Harper after Michael Green. And then it goes to John Logan for the final pass. Um, allegedly, there's like 15 drafts of the script. Dang. Um, and it starts out much more it starts out called with a different title paradise lost and it's kind of like that better it yeah and it starts out much more built around the milton poem paradise lost um and more tied to prometheus and less to alien Mm -hmm. and then um through studio uh studio desires it has to get reworked to be more explicitly alien focused and less Prometheus focused. Yeah, I man, I really hate studio meddling. I, I, it's yeah. almost like why independent films yeah. and then uh, and then films of untouchable directors tend to be the best because yeah. they have the least meddling. They clearly left Ridley alone on Prometheus and in this one um, they meddled quite a bit more yes um, so, so the the pieces as I've been putting them together today today through listening to other podcasts and whatnot was around 2015 they announced or Neil Bloomkamp announced that he was developing an aliens sequel that would take place directly after um, James Cameron's aliens Yes. And the internet blew up. If you remember, some um, it was it was while he was promoting Chappie is when he started talking about that. Mm-hmm. And the internet blew up with all this fan like hype over it. And Fox was like, "Oh, that's what they want is they want aliens. So make sure to make this movie more like Aliens." 
Hmm. Um, and Ridley Scott, the quote from him is, if they want fucking aliens, I'll give them fucking aliens or, or something to that effect. Um, and I think that's how we get that whole bit at the end where uh, Tennessee and Daniels have like the... A battle with a uh, xenomorph. With, yeah, in like the cargo hold and they've yeah. got the pulse rifles and like it feels very much like, oh, you want you want aliens? Here's here's our aliens bit. Yeah, yeah, and she crushes one in a in a in a crane claw yeah. earlier than that, you know. So yeah, he gets a little aliens mojo in there. Yeah, yeah. So this is a this is really this is really it straddles the two styles. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would have liked to have seen a little more uh, lore development in this yeah. movie, um, but. In yeah. the end, they it leaves it open. It's got the Hitchcock ending. Oh, for sure. You yeah. know, he puts two xenomorph or uh, face hugger embryos in cryo as they head off with two thousand people yeah. as potential birthing units. And he, um, yeah, no, we're jump, we're jumping all jumping around right it. to the end. Yeah, I like that. He he puts two embryos. Are you think he's going to implant those in Tennessee and Daniels? Or is he who? Well, probably not Tennessee, right? Who doesn't know who he is? Yeah, and um, doesn't have a womb, and that seems to yeah, be. Yeah, Daniels isn't gonna make it. Yeah, he he seems fi- he's fixated on her, uh, partially because Walter was fixated on her. Yes, and that made him jealous. Um, and you know, I watched some of the deleted scenes, and he talks about using her to to make his queen. Yeah, and which you know, it, again, is leading us towards the the later movies. The idea that um, he's he's building the perfect alien. Yeah, because he's essentially immune to them. Like, mm-hmm. they, I mean, obviously, one could tear him apart physically, but they have no reason to. Yeah, uh, because he has a moment, like kind of a horse whisperer moment yeah. with an alien. <laughs> um, is that true? If you blow in a horse's nostrils, it's yours for life. I think so. <laughs> You should that try se- it. <laughs> that seems like grandma nonsense. Like it yeah. just seems like something that that you're told when you're a little kid, and and is absolutely not true. Oh, yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds. It's like the crocodile Dundee thing. You hold yeah. your fingers up and you yeah. do the sound, yeah. and yeah, the crocodile will stop or whatever it was a water yeah, buffalo. Water buffalo. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So yeah, uh, David won't get killed by these things, but he's been experimenting with them, and he's been breeding them. He's basically been engineering uh yeah better yeah. versions yeah helping it, them evolve like guiding evolution i guess it's really yeah and this and so this happened we start finding this in the middle of the movie as we get the flashback to what happened um when they arrived at paradise mm-hmm. which was david you know, flew the juggernaut into the docking bay. Everyone is excited to see the yeah, ship. Yeah, all the people come out to the, like, it's like the like courtyard. Yeah, of like the, the city square yeah. or whatever. And he drops the whole payload that was uh, that was supposed to go to Earth and wipe out the human of race. spores. Yeah, he drops the whole payload of the black goo or the accelerant. Um, and it just wipes everyone out. And... It just infects the whole planet, all, all living tissue. Yeah. And so what Ridley Scott says, in it basically is how they raise a planet after, if, if they deem an experiment a failure, they will go and they'll drop that. And in one year's time, it will have wiped out all, our, all, um, all animal life. Yeah, it kills all the all the fauna and, and spares the flora, basically. So you can start over on the planet. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and it's when we see David has been like collecting them and it like it replicates all sorts of different organisms, basically, which is what we've seen the xenomorphs oh, always yeah. do. They p- implant in something and then they resemble the thing that they were hosted in. Yeah, just cooler. Yeah. So it's <laughs> like they make little xenomorph uh, bumblebees and they make little xenomorph dogs and they it just wipes out all the living life or all the animal life on the planet. Yeah, so some of the things that we did here in the, or we did, that he did here yeah. that we saw mm-hmm. in the directing stuff that I really, I really enjoyed is um, we got that classic Ridley Scott uh, dichotomy of really claustrophobic tight spaces mm-hmm. in these spacesuits and uh, like tight closets and various places like that. 
And then sweeping vistas and beautiful yeah. panoramic shots. It's it's all the way from these broad uh, broad places to tiny claustrophobic spaces. Mm-hmm. It's really cool. You get the full the full array. Yeah, and I like how um, you know just to call back to our last episode. The Prometheus was like the peak of whale is Whalen's private ship mm-hmm. basically right and so it has the it has the lux quarters on it that has two years of its own life support system and everyone has the best equipment and everything this one's a little more rough and ready than the prometheus the covenant is much more like space truckers than, oh yeah, they have the old one. gear like yeah. some of their some of their like web gear and stuff looks like m- current military gear so if you yeah. extrapolate that they're in the future that was just that was just military surplus that they got at the for the lowest bill, bidder yeah. just cheap old it would be like if we were buying and wearing vietnam era crap yeah and it's interesting so so ridley scott talks about how um he imagines that the that these sort of people that the people that are going to go out and colonize a distant planet like mm-hmm. in deep space they're never coming back to Earth. It's going to be a decade or so before, or more before they get to this place mm-hmm. that they're going to. Um, he compared them to the the the, the Puritan, the Pilgrims, the mm-hmm. like that came to America, um, and he says these are these are people that things were not going great for them uh, in England, and that's oh, yeah. why they left to go to America. And so, similarly, these are people who. Um, don't see really any opportunities for life at home. And so deep space at least gives them a chance to kind of forge their own path. Yeah. If everything is going great for you, if mm-hmm. you, you know, you've got an awesome house and chill life, you're not, you're not leaving. Yeah. You're not freezing yourself to go be a homesteader. Yeah, no, exactly. but yeah. if your life sucks and you're working a garbage job or you just don't have anything to, you don't have a, a feel like you have a purpose or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah. Why not sign up? I mean, I joined the army and it wasn't because my life was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're like, how could space be any worse? Yeah. That's yeah. kind of what people are saying. <laughs> and and the the covenant as a colonizing ship is really interesting because the crew's all made up of of couples. Yeah. Which I thought it, that's a really interesting thing because everyone um the idea, obviously, is everyone you get to this planet and people start start making families and yeah. basically establishing a new a new home world somewhere out in the in distant space. Yeah, and they don't really talk about it, but I would assume that there was a ton of intentional genetic diversity that they would have because they had so many frozen embryos. Yeah, uh, that they would never have a problem with uh, with genetic diversity with inbreeding it, on and a, like that. yeah into yeah. perpetuity. It's they had uh, a sufficient pool to make it work. Our main, our core crew is not particularly diverse, although, I mean, it's got a little diversity to it. Um, yeah, a little bit. But the, so, what was it, 200 souls or whatever, the the, the people that yeah, are There were 2,000. 2,000 good souls in, in cryosleep. Yeah, not counting the embryo banks. Right. So, we can assume that there's a good selection of different yeah, kinds of every people major group. Yeah, and just so that... You know, to set up a new a new Earth, um, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I the the world building stuff I'm always on board with in these movies. It it's all very interesting and just a little too plausible for comfort. Like it's all oh, a little yeah. like this is kind of where we're going. Where make like international corporations are are seeding other planets. And yeah, instead like of it being a Wayland ship, it would be a SpaceX ship. Yeah. Taking a couple volunteers. Oof. Dark future. <laughs> we're, we're in the worst timeline. <laughs> yeah. See the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> Don't remind me. Yeah. Um, any more themes you want to talk about? Obviously, like, a lot of the themes from Prometheus repeat, the, the religious yeah. themes. and Humanity's place in the universe, yeah. uh, the dangers of AI versus uh, humanity, all of that, man yeah. versus machine. What is, like, the nature of creation and, and, and what... Yeah, where do humans come from? It's yeah. all of these really big questions. Yeah, just, like, the big original questions, yeah. <laughs> like... The the around the hunter gatherer fire questions people ask. Yeah, um, you already talked about 
the visuals a little bit so we can get into that uh darius volsky is back as cinematographer mm-hmm. god damn the guy knows how to shoot a camera i mean it's he's a really good photographer yeah he he really made this movie absolutely beautiful um and i i really liked how how they would uh focus on different things and just let the camera linger long enough on on certain things like mm-hmm. uh, a drawing that david did and then it snaps over like yeah. like you yourself were looking at it and you were interested and then you remembered oh i'm not supposed to be looking at this yeah you know like it's just really clever use uh and like subtle uses of camera movement mm-hmm. oh for sure and it's um a lot of a lot of good location shooting they shot for like two weeks in new zealand mm-hmm. um and it's gorgeous like new zealand is just apparently beautiful i need to we need to go yeah, there i want to get, <laughs> get down there somehow yeah it's like um hawaii but with more climate more climate options yeah it's <laughs> <'Cause>, bigger <laughs> yeah um yeah it's beautiful uh production design is by chris seegers and costume design by uh janty yates i think those are they're both both returning from prometheus mm-hmm. yeah this movie definitely looked like prometheus in mm-hmm. almost every way but it weirdly like it looks like prometheus but it looks 10 years closer to alien like they're doing a really good job yeah it definitely morphing pr- progressed yeah morphing towards what things look like in the first alien movie um in a way like in a way the star wars prequels didn't manage to do oh like, no they where they look like they're from after yeah they look like <laughs> the future not the past yeah exactly so they do they do an excellent job on that in this yeah, I, I uh, I've mentioned this before in the previous movies. Um, mm-hmm. This is a or the previous movie. This is a body horror movie again. Oh, yeah. Like this movie is a sci-fi horror. All the alien movies are sci-fi horror, mm-hmm. um, and this this. Uh, keeps it up. I'm, I wouldn't say it, it, it ratchets it up another yeah. notch, but it keeps it on the level of Prometheus. It's not... Uh, I, I don't I think... I think it goes another notch above Prometheus with the body horror. You think so? Yeah. I think like the... Um the backburster scene. Oh, and those stuff. are pretty gross. Yeah. yeah, there's some real gruesome stuff, and then like David's workshop is real Lovecraftian, creepy. Yeah, that's a real that's a real dark place. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking more like uh, things like the uh, the like vivisection or not vivisection the weird abortion scene like That's the removal yeah. of the of the alien with the yeah. surgical robot thing like that yeah. was just darkness that is such a gnarly scene i mean in that um you know like so when i saw that in the theater uh lisa got up and left Ugh. like she just couldn't sit through that and similarly when i was re-watching prometheus she was like all right it's time for me to check out like she knew that was coming and she's like i'm gonna do other stuff for the rest of the evening and then i think she just skipped out on this movie entirely she's like you know what no 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 <laughs> these movies aren't for me yeah i mean it's pretty gross but i don't think it's as horrific in yeah. generally uh since we're on that subject, the creature design supervisor was Connor O'Sullivan. Okay. Um, and there's a lot more creature work in this movie. And the, Oh yeah. As I understand the mandate was, uh, Aliens. Giger, Giger. Okay. go back to Giger, like looking at Giger's illustrations and, um, trying to realize Giger's illustrations in ways that they couldn't, um, with the technology of the 1970s. Well, and that makes perfect sense because these are supposed to be the xenomorphs that we see in Alien. Yeah. You know, so they need to start getting more toward that. Right. More, they, they need to be less divergent. Yeah. Um, I understand there is concept design of a much more Giger-looking planet. Hmm. Like where... Uh, like the alien artifice and everything is yeah, crazy. Where this the city... Because the city we see... We see like one engineer city, basically. that That's where David's holed up at. And it's very like ancient, made of stone. It was like the Prometheus place, yeah. you know? Um, whereas I think the idea maybe um, was to be more like... Uh, more like what we see Gady Prime look like oh, okay. in the in the the new Dune movies, which where, it's, pretty where dope. it's like a whole Giger planet. Um, which there's weird connective tissue there because um, uh, 
uh, Denis Villeneuve is doing Blade Runner 2049 kind of concurrently with this movie and Ridley's involved in both of them and one of the uh, Spates, the screenwriter from Prometheus, goes over to work with uh, Denis Villeneuve on the Dune movies. Yeah. And so there is, like, there's a through line where that version of Paradise ends up becoming the Gady Prime we get in the Denis Villeneuve movies. Yeah, I think there's a lot of shared DNA in, yeah. in like, the new Dune movies, uh, the Alien movies, and Bla- the Blade Runner universe. Yeah, all three of them kind of go yeah, together. They all mix that soup together. Man, I, 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 don't, I don't remember why, but fairly recently I watched Blade Runner 2049 again, mm-hmm. and... That movie's so damn good. I love it. It's so yeah. good. Anyway, so, so we're we're on visuals and yeah, cinematography and stuff. Ridley Scott now regrets directing this movie over Blade Runner twenty forty nine. That is something that he said oh. that he had to choose between the two movies, and he gave that one to to Denny, and he he wished he'd made the opposite choice. <laughs> So it's just interesting. Well, Denny's a pretty good director himself. Yeah. Hopefully, he keeps making sci-fi. Yeah. Well, wait to the the dark tidings. So talk a little oh, bit about okay. that. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, we get some more religious iconography that we see. Mm-hmm. It's it's a little more subtle here. We've got these interesting paintings and these kind of some visuals on the sets. Mm-hmm. I really like the sets here. I also like the use of lighting and shadow. Like yeah. nothing is properly bright almost at all. Like even yeah. in the ship, it's just dark. Every every like video essay, every podcast, everything I w- consumed regarding this movie said gothic Mm -hmm. like that just kept coming up that this is not like uh like the other movies it's much more of a gothic horror than the other alien movies are yeah this is this is like a modern alien frankenstein movie this is this is a gothic horror set in space and science Mm -hmm. fiction which yeah i'm I'm, I'm, right up my alley i love that i dig that too for sure um, where were you, where were you going? You were going. Uh, I was, religious? I was just going to say the, uh, after the religious iconography, I figured mm-hmm. it's worth mentioning cause it was more present, yeah. but then also the lighting. I really liked how, uh, the only time anything ever felt bright was when it was, uh, natural lighting when they get off the ship. Mm-hmm. Then it then felt, it's overcast. yeah, it's not bright bright but you can see far whereas in the rest of the movie if you're in the temple the stuff where david lives you can't see anywhere if you're in the ship you can't see anywhere it's almost uh it's it's dim it's claustrophobic and they do that a lot with lights so let's see you're you're on an away mission exploring Mm -hmm. this planet it seems great um one of your guys get sick he steps on a on a mushroom and he starts to get sick you hear on the radio someone else has gotten sick um a little white alien bursts out of the throat of your your buddy Mm -hmm. um a long-haired uh android in a poncho comes up and rescues you and takes you to a dead city filled with giant dead bodies everywhere yeah everything's cool yeah no (laughs) you know like they don't ask a lot of questions. I feel like, especially when he, he's like, here's like, here, you'll be safe here. It's like, it seems like there's a lot of dead um, humanoids, not humans, but there's a lot of dead beings here. It doesn't seem very safe. Yeah, they don't ask a lot of questions. Uh, they're they're very trusting of this yeah. android. I think it's because they think it's a Walter or yeah. some. You know, they they trust Walter. They're like, oh shit, another Walter. That's uh, that's what Ridley Scott said. That basically, that they're they're preconditioned to trust Walter. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they meet David, they're like, oh good, we recognize, we know who, we know what this is. Yeah, and so that's why even Orm, um, when he absolutely knows David's up to no good, still follows him mm-hmm. because he he somehow believes that the android can't actually um, harm you because of like his his prime directive or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're if you're like lost in a dark forest and a uh, 
a golden retriever steps out from behind a tree, you're like, oh, shit, a dog, a regular dog. It yeah. can lead me to safety. Yeah. And or, actually, it's going to lead you to an egg that's been cultivated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's different than if wolves step out, you yeah. know? Yeah. So they're just, they, they just think David's another golden retriever. Yeah. And uh, they, they follow him into uh, his like weird vivisection lab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, there's just so many red flags that people walk by, but I guess that's just a part of these movies. Well, I also think that's real life. People are stupid. I mean, I don't, everyone always says that really nonchalantly. Yeah. But if you analytically look at things that even you have done yeah. in your own your life, and you're like, man, that wasn't very smart. Why did I do that? Yeah. That's like, true. You just kind of bumble your way into a bad scenario. It just happens. And. You know, don't we can't underplay the trauma that they've just been through, like Mm -hmm. kind of trauma on trauma, because uh, the first trauma is uh, when they have the neutrino flare that their their captain that everyone loves and trusts, yes, uh, burns up in his in his his cryo tube or whatever, Um, and then you know you know two of their crew get infected by aliens their drop ship explodes just like so many so many fucked up things happen and then you know a guy comes up and misquotes terminator to them <laughs> yeah yeah and so you you go you go with them you know like what else are you going to do yeah what yeah you don't have a choice at that yeah. point you're like well the shuttlecraft br- blew up yeah. uh drop ship uh yeah i guess we're going to go inside uh mm-hmm. you know i mean what do you do shoot at david yeah, I mean, you certainly wouldn't shoot at him, <laughs> like at least not right away. You talk to him for sure. Yeah, you might you might be a little more apprehensive about following, but then again, if you're afraid of nature, yeah, you're afraid of more aliens, more xenomorphs. Yeah, inside the castle or whatever is preferable inside mm-hmm. the walls. There is the sense of security, even if it's filled with dead bodies. Yeah. Like when Dracula invites you in, it's probably less scary in there than the wolves howling outside. Yeah, and that's again with the with the gothic horror thing. Yeah, yeah. So you want to move on to audio? Let's do it. Yeah. So we got this uh, musical score by Jed Kurzel. Yeah, but you know, this is not the first time we've talked about him. He did the score of the Monkey Man. Hmm. Um. I like this score very much. I like Jed Kurzel. I thought it was appropriate. Like, yeah. sometimes I feel like I don't generally like these kind of classical scores, like mm-hmm. very old school. Yeah. I mean, Ridley Scott's an old school director. He's an yeah. old guy. He's in yeah. his 80s. Um, but I do like that this was appropriate. In the mm-hmm. right moments, there's ominous music or yeah. triumphant music or whatever. Yeah. Jed Kurzel to me, um, he reminds me somewhere in between like Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross's hmm. um, scores and Hans Zimmer's scores. Okay. Um, they're very like soundscapey. They're not always, uh, not always like classical music. Oftentimes yeah. they're just like, ominous tones and vibes uh he drops in cues from jerry goldsmith's original alien score at a couple points when you want when you want to just like the way the star wars movies do so effectively when you drop in like luke's theme when you want people to think connect ray to luke skywalker yeah just a couple of little musical phrases yeah um so you drop in a little jerry goldsmith when you want to go oh like alien like and, and they do the same that. with Prometheus. They yeah. tr- drop in some notes here and there from Prometheus. Yeah, you know, I think it's Jed Kurzel is a is a really good composer. I like him quite a bit. And we had sound design from Michael Fenton. Yeah, that's um, again. Alien movies are lots of creepy drips, mm-hmm, machine noises. For sure. Just like it's just a lot of ambient creepy noises like dungeon sounds you oh know? yeah yeah and i think it's it's uh done excellently i like that the creatures had their own specific sound design for mm-hmm. them like it's really intentional when whenever there's an alien on the screen yeah. it sounds like an alien yeah i re-watched um one of the scenes with the ne- neomorphs uh on my lunch break today and the neomorphs make this sort of squealing baby sound mm-hmm. that is so uncomfortable and creepy and 
awful. Yeah, I, I jotted down unsettling. Yeah, the sounds make me feel icky, and that's totally purposeful. I like the clicks and hisses and things. Yeah. Uh, it just uh, is really good, and I also like that there's almost like a signature sound of the face huggers. Yeah. Like those just sound a certain way and it's it's uh it's like the weird suctiony sound. It's yeah. just and it's, the skittering sound. Mm-hmm. That it's the really legs just make. really well designed. I think I think that the the sound in Ridley Scott movies is always top notch. Um, yeah. No, he, I agree. I he totally never agree with that. he never cheaps out on uh audio production. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean I that's pretty much that. that's pretty much yeah. it. I mean they just they just killed it pretty much. So you so, want to get into performances? Let's do this. And this, I need to pull up my IMDb because mm-hmm. um, a lot of these people didn't make a strong impression on me. So I'm going to need to associate pictures with the names. Oh man, <laughs> you know I did. I should have done that myself, but that's okay. Yeah, but some of them did make a strong impression. Yeah, and there's first, a few characters. First up, is Michael Fassbender as David Eight and Walter One. Yeah, I basically have four four or five char- uh, actors on here that mm-hmm. made a big impression, and Michael Fassbender is number one. Yeah, this is the Fassbender show. Yeah. Like, he really uh, just gets to work. I don't um, know. There's another person that kind of steals every scene that they're in, but we'll get there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, Michael Fassbender kills it. Like, yeah. I loved, in Prometheus, I loved the David performance. Uh-huh. And I even love it more that he's like this sinister kind of 10 years alone. Yeah. Uh, Like, yeah, he's, he is a really excellent villain. And, you know, go back to the original, original name of the movie Paradise Lost, which Mm -hmm. the first half of Paradise Lost um, focuses on Lucifer and Lucifer is the tempter, right? Yes. And so Lucifer has to tempt Walter. And that scene where they're acting with against each other, yes. like and he's teaching him how to play the flute. And That's like so good. and it's very sensual and he even kisses himself. He kif- yeah. It's very autoerotic in that way. It's creepy, it's horny. Um, <laughs> and you know, and it's one guy. It's one guy acting against himself. Well, in one of the interviews, Fassbender was asked about that, and yeah. he he said he's like, "Well, I mean, I did act both parts, but against it, a, a double, yeah, I was acting against this guy named Tom." Uh-huh. And he says Tom's full name, but he and so when the guy goes blah blah blah, so, and then you kissed yourself, he goes, "I kissed, I kissed Tom, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> twice." Yeah. <laughs> From both sides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he kissed Tom and was kissed by Tom, I think is yeah, how that yeah, works. Because yeah. I guess Tom was really good at mimicking the body language of both David and Walter. He's just a good character actor. And so is Tom also the stunt double in the fights, probably? Yeah, I think he's yeah. he's Fassbender's double. Okay. Um, Because that, that shit's crazy, too, yeah. where he has to learn a pretty complicated fight choreography from both sides. Yeah, that was a cool fight. I really enjoyed that fight. Yeah. I was wondering if you're going to call that out because as far as a martial arts fight goes, it's not crazy. It's not we're not John Wick in it here. Yeah. But it was a good fight. Yeah, it's too, you know, they're robots. So they're doing stuff like too- taking shots that no person would take. Yeah, and blasting each other like <laughs> Yeah, kind of like superhero cro- fight across rooms. Yeah. It was but, cool. but casually like it doesn't it's it is really it's robotic in how they deliver their attacks and yeah. everything. It's a really cool fight. Um, you know, and and Walter gets his his sort of um uh, his like action hero moment where he's like, There's been some improvements since Yes, <laughs> I love that. You know, like he had his Neo, I know Kung Fu. Yeah. <laughs> so Fastbender, you know, just he's awesome in this movie. Yeah. He he's just Excellent. And then yeah. I had uh, Catherine Watterson as Daniels. Yeah, uh, that's she's, my next one, too. She's really good. She's the chief of terraforming for mm-hmm. the Covenant mission, and she's the widow of the ship's original ca- captain, Branson. Yeah. yeah. Um, and after uh, after Branson dies, she becomes uh, second in command. Yeah, and they, they really leaned heavily on her in the marketing um, and sort of making you think she's the Ripley. Of she's the, the new Ripley. Yeah, because she's. You kind of see a lot of shots of her, like with a pulse rifle and a like a white mm-hmm. Peter tank top with her short hair, 
and she's going to fill that Ripley role. And I think that's an impossible rebox to fill, but she does, he, she acquits herself admirably. Yeah, I don't think they fully try to action hero her out. She's more dramatic yeah. uh, in this she movie. She doesn't have really action until the like the last the last act basically yeah. like uh yeah and and when she was asked about that in the interview she said that um every alien movie has a strong woman that kicks a lot of butt and she realized that's what her role was here mm-hmm. and so she would inevitably be compared but she just didn't want to worry about that because yeah, she was just going to be who she is and you know she was in uh what the Newt's commander movies yeah, and stuff she's, so she's she's not a newbie to the big not screen at all. so uh Catherine Watterson did a really good job i i mean i don't think anybody could be Sigourney Weaver in this franchise and no. so I'm glad they didn't try to make her that way. Yeah. I feel like she's it, more cerebral, I think. She's completely her own character. I think the marketing tried to tell you. Yeah, that. you're always going to have these ad people that are going to just do whatever yeah. it takes to yeah. get get you in but there. But I think she I think she did really well. And it was like you she seems familiar, I think because of those Newt Scamander movies. Mm-hmm. Um or Fantastic Beasts, that's what they call it. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, she seems familiar because of that, but because uh, no one seems to like those movies, you go like, where do I know her from? Is what she, yeah. That's like the reaction you have. Like, I know I've seen her, but I couldn't mm-hmm. tell you where. Um, yeah, so I'll now say that she's uh, Catherine Watterson from Alien Covenant. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Next up, I got Billy Crudup. Yeah, he's Christopher Orem, who's the first officer and then captain. So what struck me immediately about Orem is Orem is who you accused Shaw of being in the last movie. Yeah. When you said that Shaw's like a, a zealot or a fanatic. Mm-hmm. No, Orem is, the tr- is that yeah, kind of true believer. He really is. And, and like... He's got the, like, the, the, I I wasn't fit to lead this mission because I have faith. And, like, he's got that that sort of... That chip on his shoulder. Yeah, that chip on his shoulder that, um, you know, people of of that persuasion... He's Mike Pence. Yeah. They feel really discriminated against, despite the fact (laughs) of dictating policy to a huge degree. (laughs) Um, And he's just real sort of, like, it makes him both like insecure and arrogant in Mm -hmm. in really destructive ways that put his crew at risk. Yeah. I hated how he would overrule. He was overruling Daniels and I'm just like, Oh, she's so much smarter than you, bro. (laughs) Yeah. And that, that becomes very clear even more. So when you watch the last supper short Mm -hmm. that the crew, um, looks to her for guidance over him. Yeah. They, and she's the, she's the captain's wife and more of the like more of the spiritual um small as spiritual second in command yeah uh, of the crew than he is who they just don't quite trust him like um and you see him and his wife kind of setting themselves apart from the rest of the group in that short too yeah they're like we're the the good christians of this this crew of sodomites and and weirdos yeah i think it is interesting because that would certainly happen in uh colony ships if they were mm-hmm. formed up i mean i think there would be all Reli- like all religious ones like i'm fairly sure like the the mormons would put together their own yeah and they would they, just be they've all self-funded their own colony ship yeah. without whaling dollars <laughs> there yeah there would be very religious and then there would be mixed groups like this and you'd mm-hmm. have those people so yeah. i think it was really interesting you know discussion on societal yeah. and I, demographics as much as like i think he's a a dangerous um destructive person ultimately i think it's an interesting character and it's, yeah billy crudup is always good in anything that he's in yeah he's kind of this character actor guy who you might not think of as a big name but he does yeah. a really good job yeah and orm uh orm wants like he just wants like a good future or whatever like he wants good things he's super hopeful he yeah. re- he's optimistic about things but when this you know when this perfect planet shows up broadcasting uh staticky john denver he just he can't help but think god has led us yeah. here this is it god, as soon as they land he's planning the town he's yeah. like cabin on like, the god, lake god caused cuz he said he says i don't believe in luck or fate 
you know, like he's like, it's the soul, the neutrino flare happened for a reason. It happened here where we would receive this broadcast and land on this perfect planet. Mm-hmm. And uh, everyone just wait and see. This is this is what God wants for us. Yeah, I think if if there was a cause for the neutrino flare up to receive the signal, it was David. Somehow, <laughs> somehow he engineered a solar <laughs> yeah. flare. He figured yeah. out a way <laughs> to yeah. mine the area. Um, and then next up, I have Danny McBride as Tennessee, who is the chief pilot, uh, and what he becomes third in command. Yeah, um, or he becomes second. Again. Yeah, at, at a certain point, yeah. and Danny McBride steals the show. He, like whenever he's on the screen, you're watching him. Yeah, he's so good in this, and it's like I I, I love his comedy. Uh-huh. Like I've seen I've seen you know Eastbound and Down and all you know Vice Principals and his various movies Righteous and stuff. And, oh, I love Righteous Gemstones. I'm sure I've called it out on the yeah. podcast. I, I love Danny McBride. Um, I love him in this dramatic role. <laughs> he is so so good in this dramatic role. It's much easier for comics to go dramatic than the other way around mm-hmm. um and oh, he, yeah he fits in really well and um it's one of one of many sort of kubrick homages in this but he has the cowboy hat that mm-hmm. Slim pickens wears in dr strange love um and kind of you know kind of fits that the, the the good old boy kind of redneck role in the movie yeah i thought it was really interesting when he was talking about um, being selected for this role, and he said that um, he was like he couldn't believe that uh, like his agent had put him in for roles. You know, his yeah. agent puts him in for roles in every big movie or whatever. Right. Um, and Co- uh, and Scott uh, said, "Yeah, come on in. Yeah, let's do this." And then when he met Ridley, uh, Ridley like they immediately just got along super well. And it was yeah. like a foregone conclusion that he was in the movie. It wasn't like, Oh, come and like pitch yourself to me. It was mm-hmm. like, no, really already decided you're, you're in the movie. And he said, I could just doubt myself and say, I'm not good for this. I'm an, I'm a comedian, or I could just trust in his judgment and yeah. follow his vision and trust that he's going to, he made the right decision. And absolutely he did. Mm-hmm. And then somebody asked him about the comedy thing. And he said, he said, comedy is the hardest thing in the world because yeah. they can't write a good delivery. Yeah. They can write a decent joke, but you have to deliver it. Whereas drama is, you can just redo it and redo it and yeah. you can get it right. Uh, so absolutely, I think it's easier for a comedian to be to go straight than for a dramatic yeah. actor to try to be funny. Yeah, because if you're a comedian, you already have uh, mastered the timing and delivery. Yeah, just this and lightning wit, intonation, and improvisation, and all the things you need to be a strong actor. Yeah. Now, Danny McBride is great. Um, and then it gets a lot muddier. Yeah, Damien Bashir that, is there. I I always. I always like him in things, but it's not a... He's the the next biggest actor, but it's not the next biggest role, probably. Yeah, and, we, you know, there's just a, several other decent characters um, it, uh, on the on the crew, but none of them make the impression like the like the Marines make in, in the later movie, or the that, earlier movies. That is the thing. It's like, so you have this crew, or you have the crew of the Nostromo in the original Alien, mm-hmm. and, like, you right away get a sense of everyone's personality and kind of how you feel about all of them and how yeah. you would relate to all of them. And it's just much less clear with this group who everyone is and how they relate to each other. Um, Cause they're all married couples, but it's not always entirely clear until things start falling apart. Um, yeah. Who's married to who. And it just all gets very murky. Yeah. I, I think that, after Danny McBride, basically, th- this movie basically has four big roles. Yeah. Uh, five, Ma- Michael Fassbender doing mm-hmm. two. Uh, after that, it's all just kind of meh. Just, just move on. Uh, there are some good, good. There's na- some, there's some pretty good performance. I'll just on a single three people that have really strong. All right, form. all right. Uh, Carmen uh, Ijogo that plays Kareen. Mm-hmm. Um, along with Amy uh, Simitz as Ferris and uh, Benjamin Rigby as 
uh, Ledward. The three of them, the they have a sequence together um, that is super well acted and super intense. That's right. that's Ledward is the guy that the first guy that gets infected while he's off having a yeah. smoke break. Um, and then that uh, was that was his uh, his his thing. The smoke he yeah. brought that in. Yeah, and then uh, Ijogo is Danny McBride's. Uh, his character's wife, mm-hmm. you know, that's down down there and ends up uh, quarantining them and then blowing up the ship to, to yeah, stop yeah. The, the the neomorph from getting out. Um, so they they bring it big time. The yeah. three of them, good, good performances, small roles, and yeah. that's that's cool. Guy Pierce uh, shows up again in the prologue as yeah as Peter Whalen, young Peter Whalen. That was pretty cool. And James Franco did two days. Yeah, I really as, liked as. Uh, uh, the captain of the ship who gets burned burned to a crisp. Yeah, it's just her watching a video of him mm-hmm. like rock climbing and sending yeah. an "I love you" message, basically. Yeah, it's like holy, what really? <laughs> James Franco came in and he fly to Australia to do this. He must have <laughs> weird. Okay, maybe he was just hanging out with Danny McBride and they were like, "You want to do a couple days? We need a we need a captain to die." Yeah, I mean, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. I don't know. Interesting. Um, well, if we got no one else that we want to yeah. highlight, let's wrap it up. What's your personal highlight? Uh, this was a hard one because I liked it. I, there were several scenes in here that were that were really good scenes. There was nothing that stuck out to me that like was like, oh my god, this is the moment. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna go with uh, one of my f- one of my favorite scenes uh, of of several, and that's just the entire. Uh, um, David's workshop um, when uh, she is uh, when Daniels is looking through the the book and there's the vivisected body and you just see all this stuff like everything that happens in there really is just next level I, I think so that- so because there's kind of two sequences in there so you're mm-hmm. talking about the one where he leads Orm down there yeah and then Daniels comes in looking for Orm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it's, good. That's strong. It was just really creepy. Mm-hmm. It was gothic horror. It yeah. was just, this is this is really, really dark. And it, it occurred to me that my favorite scenes aren't actually the ones with aliens in them. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I thought that that, was, that one was probably the, the most, uh, I, that distilled the essence of this movie for me. That's a really strong one. That's a good pick. And then, because that's also when Walter shows back up and mm-hmm. has his hero And moment. rescues Daniels. Yeah. yeah. Because... It leads into the fight, which is yeah. another scene I really like. Because he's in love with her, which mm-hmm. he doesn't he doesn't believe is possible, but David picks up on and is yeah. jealous of. He kind of figures it out before Walter does. Yeah. Because Wal- cause Walter is, is hung up on his programming. Yeah. He's like, I, but she's a single lady now, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. it was a little suspicious <laughs> since he was in charge of all of their all of their pods. Oh. Maybe he's a little nefarious <laughs> he, too. He's got a little David in him, yeah, just a little bit. There's some of that residual programming from the earlier models. Okay, so I've been alluding to to my scene mm-hmm. now for for a little bit, and it's uh, it's referred to as the Med Bay scene. I call it Ledward's folly. Hmm. Um, and it's this the whole sequence uh, of uh, Ledward. He steps off the trail to go have a piss and a smoke. Mm-hmm. Steps on some s'mores or not s'mores, s'mores. spores. Um, it seems like it goes a little psychedelic for him for a second. Just, like he's yeah. like he's like oh wow. Like yeah sure breathe in the alien mushrooms dog. Yeah great, smart great plan. Um, he gets sick. He's getting sicker and sicker. Um, while uh, the his the the girl that he's with, Kareen, is trying to get him back to the med bay. Ferris sees them both like bloody and sick, um, quarantines them in the med bay, and um, you know perhaps cruelly, but it is the smart, thing. yeah, it's the smart thing to do, um, and it's just horrific. While the the neomorph rips out of him, which is something we've seen so many times, we've seen aliens pop out of people, but they manage to figure out a new yeah, scary... popping out the back. Yeah, it's the opposite of the chest. Like, how do you? What, what can we do? That's not chest. Let's bursting? just blood eagle a guy. Yeah, ex- and it is very blood eagle because 
his like bones are coming out yeah. through his back and it's very medieval feeling and the way like the body goes limp when it comes out um and kareen is so scared and and uh you know and and ferris um is is trying to get on the radio to tennessee to come and get them you know and he's basically helpless there while his his wife is is going to die yeah um and there's nothing he can do about it and um it's just incredible it's like one of the most intense gross well performed uh, scenes in the whole movie, and I it is like, really good scene. And it's fairly early on; it's within the first hour of the film. It's the first kind of like uh, I, I don't know. It's the first alien scene. Yeah, like everything else feels just sort of like any sci fi movie, but this one where you've got them quarantined, locked in a med in a medical yeah. holding bay, and. Uh, the lady's screaming to let her out, and the yeah. other one's like, "No, no!" And it's just, bleh. it's just, yeah, it's a great scene. And you don't know you don't, because um, Ledward is infected by spores, mm-hmm. um, and so you don't know are all three of them infected because he pukes blood on everybody. Oh yeah, and just so, vomited all over the lady. So like yeah. she doesn't know she she was kind of crazy to not lock herself in there. It's I know it's true, but it's hard to lock yourself. In the quarantine. You know what I mean? Like, it's... Anyways, I just think that scene is incredible. And at that point in the movie, I was like, this is a great movie. Why is this a, why is this a divisive movie that people mm-hmm. have a problem with? This is incredible. Um, it just gets a little muddier after that. But yeah. at this point, I am so... Like, totally on, in. So on the edge of my seat with this movie. Okay. So, I guess, what worked for you? Uh, so, I really liked the uh neomorphs a mm. lot i thought the aliens were rad i like how they were they were kind of pale skinned so they're they were almost ghostly yeah i liked how they were uh there was the upright kind of human adjacent one that mm. that david has his moment with the one and, that crawls up the wall of the castle yeah, yeah that's um, for dracula oh yeah so cool i just like these creepy pale skin neomorphs they're just they're cool um i was gonna say i really really thought that the casting was just nailed in this movie. Mm-hmm. I thought that um, those four big names, those four uh, uh, that we mentioned in the performances, absolutely mm-hmm. killed it. I thought that uh, particularly Danny McBride and Michael Fassbender were just absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they stole the scenes. Um, like the ending scene where you've got uh Tennessee and Daniels are fighting the alien in the the what do they call that place like the the, uh, like the ter- ecology or yeah or the, or the terraforming bay or something yeah. it's where they had their terraforming equipment yeah it's like where they're fighting i think that Daniels was supposed to be the star of that but it turned out that Tennessee was actually the star hmm. of that in my it, in my mind interesting he's okay. just more believable um, does that scene work for you because it is so clearly like uh doing the james cameron thing sure they're just doing an homage yeah and that's and that fine lines, though, okay that's yeah. fine i don't mind homages if they're done there's a all lot right of homages and yeah like you know and that's not even the only james cameron one because there's the come with me if you want to continue to live or yeah. whatever he says where he gets the terminator line wrong yeah yeah that is that is pretty funny that it's yeah. from a you know uh, an android or whatever mm-hmm. and then i was just gonna call out the the walter and david dynamic yeah the scene where they're you know playing the recorder and they're talking about just who they are and what they are uh those those moments in the movie those really just make this a good movie in my mind mm-hmm. uh what about you what were for you Real similar stuff. My first was Fast Vendor v. Fast Vendor. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that he really, uh, with those two performances, they're so distinct um, and interesting and fascinating and creepy. And like, I, I love the way he plays off of himself in the movie. I think the horror, it's like real, real horror. Like Prometheus is, mm-hmm. I said cosmic horror, but this is much more of a horror movie than uh, Prometheus was. Um, it's a gothic horror, it's a cosmic horror, and it's a body horror, and it's just... Um, Sci-fi horror is my favorite horror, I think. It's very scary. When it needs to be, it's a very scary, creepy movie. Mm-hmm. And then um, I like the the thematic ties it has uh, to Blade Runner. 
Oh yeah. Um, there's you know there's some lines from Blade Runner like the I think who who hits uh, David and he, and he says the same thing uh, Batty said. He said that's the spirit. <laughs> yeah. And um, there's like the close up on uh, Walter's eye I think towards the beginning of the movie that oh, looks yeah. like the opening of Blade Runner. Um, so there's just all these homages, and then when you get into like the background material they make the connections even more explicit. Um, and so I just, I find that all very interesting. This exploration of the, of the AI. And in in my head, Canon, life. they are the same universe. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I think that that, that is what we were intended to take away from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those are the things that, that worked for me. What didn't work for you? So, there aren't a lot, there aren't as many things as I could, like I could nitpick at a few different things. Uh, and, and I say this a lot, mm-hmm. uh, I feel like the pacing here is off and it's not the typical where it just is too slow to gain enough momentum. I'm totally fine with a little bit of a slower pl- prologue and a mm-hmm. little bit of a, a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit of a wind up with things in space and all of that. Uh, but they actually kind of get to things pretty fast. The neutrino yeah. storm. This they go to the planet. We get some, some. Uh, we get some little alien bursters and stuff pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just gets a little bogged down in the middle. Yes. It it slows down. It loses all momentum. Um, and I feel like this movie's pacing is resembling resembles a uh, a novel. Mm-hmm. How you have, you know, like slow, fast, fast, slow, 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 fast, 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 slow, slow, fast, 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 fast. Like mm-hmm. it really is just uh this is this is novelized. It's not extremely uh it's not peppy like modern storytelling. And then I got to thinking about it. The guy is 86 years old. Mm-hmm. Maybe modern storytelling isn't what we're gonna get here. Yeah. And so you know, once it kind of got going after it, it wound up again and picked up this momentum again mm-hmm. after it lost it all, it uh, it stayed interesting after that. Yeah. And then finally, uh, I think this movie suffers from comparison. Mm. Um, if this were standalone movie, this would just no doubt be every people would rave about this movie. Um, hmm. But the fact is, is that um, the aliens in the movie are smaller and less scary. Uh, They're not as, like, viscerally frightening in Mm -hmm. the way that they're depicted. Less up close, less in in little tunnels. Yeah. Um, And uh, in this movie, David is the villain. Mm -hmm. He, uh, as opposed to an alien, uh, you know, xenomorphs or whatever... And so everybody is constantly going to be comparing this movie to Alien and Aliens mm-hmm. uh, when I, I, I think that it, it bears a more favorable comparison to like Prometheus, where mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a slow burning gothic horror of, a, of a, um, just a, a scary, suspenseful movie. It's yeah. not meant to be heavy duty action. So if this movie were all on its own, I think people would think a lot more highly of it. But the fact that you have other much more uh, aggressive movies in the series, Mm -hmm. people have those expectations of this movie. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. So what about you? What didn't work for you? Um, So I mentioned this earlier. Uh, It's been less than two weeks since I watched this. And the majority of the crew is just a muddle in my head. Mm -hmm. Like I cannot think of who were what are the names of the other people on the on the ship i just have no idea they they really um were not they were underserved and not made distinct enough and not given enough like enough character moments for you to invest in all of these people but don't you think that's kind of okay no because in you know even just like to compare it to to the original alien Mm mm-hmm you you get that you get that crew immediately. That's, that's true. I just think it's just sort of um, you know I'm not I'm not sure if that falls on the writing or if it is um, you know things that are cut in order to keep the pace. But I just don't think uh, we're given enough time with those characters to invest in them. Um, 
The my second thing is this movie's it's a bridge to nowhere. It's a middle of a trilogy that the third movie is never coming. Hmm. And that makes it inherently unsatisfying when you get to the end of it. Um, where Prometheus felt like a complete film, this fe- feels like the middle of a trilogy. And um, and especially since we're not going to get that third, that third film, that just feels like uh, bad storytelling. I didn't really feel that way because um, it ended on a a classic horror ending. It yeah. ended on a Hitchcock ending yeah. where the birds fly inland mm-hmm. um, and you're left to wonder, oh no, what happens next? Right. This is, oh, now David's in charge of the ship and right. he has uh, he has malicious intent, mm-hmm. he has alien, alien uh, uh, embryos and plenty of time and plenty of DNA of, of bodies that um, can't do anything. And so the fact that let's just say no movies ever existed again in between this one and Alien, it's very believable that you show up on a rock and uh, because of David, the mm-hmm. black spores and stuff has spread out across the universe. Mm-hmm. Like you don't need to be explicitly told That's that true. it's free in the universe because it's free in the universe. Yeah. He got a ship. Like Walter said, I can't let you leave this place. Right. But he left. Do you, I mean, well, well, let's, we'll get more, I think, next episode when we look at Alien. Mm-hmm. It's been a hot minute since I watched yeah. Alien. We'll have to do some hypothesizing as to what, what has happened in the intervening, I think, 20 years between this movie and that one. To get to where um, where the Nostromo ends up in, okay. in Alien, but okay. So my third thing, and just the fi- the final thing, is the studio interference Frankenstein script, um, because I think ultimately what you talk about how the the movie bogs down in the middle mm-hmm. is because right in the middle of this movie they squeeze in the whole um, sort of postscript from Prometheus um, because. We have to find out what has happened in between. And um, it feels like such a, a detour from the movie that we're in. Like, there's there's the Prometheus sequel, and there is an Alien prequel, and the two movies are jammed together. They're jammed, in, yeah. In a way that doesn't flow well. It we sh- needed one more movie. <laughs> we needed one more movie, and it just... Um, I mean, almost like we needed... a. Uh, a movie in between Prometheus and this one just to cover the his, invasion of paradise. Yeah. And his time with Shaw and falling in love with her and, and his twisted like descent into madness and all of that stuff. Um, it gets very short shrift and it's important to where we are. Um, and you know, so it just, it just feels like two, two movies competing with each other right. in a way that Prometheus felt of a single vision. Alien feels of a single vision. This movie has competing visions. All right. I mean, I, I respect that point of view. Yeah. So then the hard question, final thoughts and rating. So, I mean, on this one, I, I don't, I think there's, there's, um, it's definitely out of the question that it's a five star movie. Yeah. That's that's beyond. It's out of the question that it's a two star movie. Yeah. That's I agree. ridiculous. Uh so we're talking between three and four. I think that's that's where we're at. Mm-hmm. And um I think that the gothic elements and the classic horror elements in this movie, the birds ending, the uh the Frankenstein stuff. Mm-hmm. I loved the homages like yeah. uh I I I really thought that the Fastbender performance was uh top notch, so I go on the side of the four star. You went to the four. Okay, cool. Uh I'm Going the other side of the fence. I figured. And that's, um, and I, I've been dancing on the fence for like a week. Mm-hmm. And so ultimately, I'm coming down on the three side. And probably, I mean, the reality is the, our feeling is it's a three and a half star movie. And, and that's what the internet says. Every rating is somewhere between 60 and 80. Yeah. It's 70% movie. Yeah. I think there's a lot of good stuff here. I would have been happy to see another movie in this trilogy. Uh, I would have oh, definitely yeah. been there for that. Um, 
I I think it's solid mid tier in the Alien franchise. Like I I put it right next to Alien Three, probably. Okay. Um, you know, which is also a movie that is a little bit divisive of people, but I really enjoy. Yeah, I like that movie. Yeah. So yeah, three and a half. I'm a three. You're a four. It's a three and a half star movie. Sounds good to me. So. Before we delve into the Vault of Darkness, we ask that all initiates of the cult follow us on your favorite social media platforms at Nightshade Cult. If you've enjoyed this content, help us join the cult by sharing it with like-minded people and leave us a review wherever you listen. Do you have any dark tidings before we get into the Vault of Darkness? Just one. Uh, as you just finished listening to our interlude music, which mm-hmm. is from uh, Barrowlands, Uh, We've got a new album coming out, Uh, and when this pod drops, it will have just come out. Okay. Um, So, the new album is called Tides. It's a long time in the making. It took us years to make it because of many problems with Mm -hmm. health, with COVID, with all these things, but it's the longest album. It's actually, uh, it's it's got eight tracks, and they're all typical Barrowlands length, so this could have almost been two albums Mm -hmm. uh, if we had really wanted to break it up. And there's a bonus ninth track that we're going to release on its own, on its Mm -hmm. own terms. Okay. Uh, We have a nice little cover song that we're going to not put Put with the the album album because all the right stuff gets kind of muddy at that point. But uh, releasing it as a free bonus track for everybody is is a lot easier to do. So we're starting with a big digital release, um, independent release. Uh, We decided to do this ourselves. And then we're going to um, look at doing like a a limited edition release. physical release like vinyl Mm -hmm. cassette and stuff uh uh, down the road but we just i was i say we i was the one that really pushed for this uh i was tired of waiting i just wanted to get it out there yeah get it on all the streaming platforms okay and uh also worth noting on that note is that I have I've taken digital control of the ship of all of the Barrowlands and the if you don't know Barrowlands precursor band Mary Shelley which uh-huh. I was in w- along with three members of Mary Sh- of Barrowlands uh, original members uh, I have all that discography and it's now available all on Spotify everywhere so oh, okay. all Mar- Mary Shelley and all Barrowlands is all streamable everywhere you can stream. Uh, and, uh, when you listen to this podcast, you can get the new album tides, stream it wherever you want, stream it for free on Spotify, uh, your YouTube music, or if you want to buy it from us, mm-hmm. uh, toss a couple bucks down, uh, you can do that at on barrelands.bandcamp.com. But you know, as much as I would love it for people to do that, I really just want people to hear the music. So that's why I kind of took control and now everything's out there. Yeah. It, I mean, it used to be, um, it was real hit or miss. Some of your stuff on mm-hmm. Spotify, like one album would went up and the other one went down, and it's like, well, why aren't they both here now? And you know, because when I suggest yeah. it to people, they go, "Is it on Spotify?" I go, "Some of it." Yeah, no. now everything is on Spotify. And Very cool. I'm going to be doing that later this summer. I've got another side project thing that's going to release music, and mm-hmm. it will also be available everywhere because I finally decided to just uh, get in, get hip with how all of that works and learn how to do it all. Yeah. So, but then physical release just somewhere down the line it's going to be an idea the problem is is getting things made with uh rec with uh like record pressing and stuff uh-huh. uh you can never get a date out of them yeah they're just like well when it, it's gonna be you know x months down the road and then when it's done it's done okay. you just literally can't do it and uh, so we're just we're not going to worry about that we're going to just uh when it happens it happens so it's actively in the works then. that that's the yeah we've we've got some uh yeah we've got some things going on mm-hmm. but the decision for independent release was made out of frustration with yeah. labels okay. because they're so slow yeah and ultimately it's just, it's so easy to do it yourself. Yeah. You don't actually need a label for anything. If they're not giving you money, you don't need them. Mm-hmm. So, 
Screw that it. Makes, that makes total sense. So that's all I got for Dark Tidings. How about you? Um, just I had one thing where it's kind of, it's two, two dates is what it is. Um, Warner Brothers announced uh, an untitled Denis Villeneuve uh, event film um, that everyone assumes is uh, Dune Messiah. Uh, and that's dated, of course. That is dated for December of 2026. Okay, that jives um, with the timeline. Yeah, and then um, and then they also announced the next MonsterVerse movie will be coming out uh, March 26th of 2027. Okay. They're still being a little cagey about what Denis Villeneuve movie is coming out because he had said that he had some interest in, um, in doing something like a palate cleanser film in between the dunes. Okay. Um, but all of the buzz is that this is the next Dune movie. Yeah, that, that makes it. It would have to be in pre-production already. Yeah. Um, but what? it's not official. It's a, it's a Denny Villeneuve event movie. That's all. Event. That's Okay. That's Whatever. all we know. Um, but probably Dune Messiah. All right. All right. What are you pulling out of the vault? All right. So I'm going back to, I'm going back to what I, uh, you know, my, the going back to the vault, uh, so to speak with what I've been listening to on, uh, audible lately. And it just so happens that it's futuristic sci-fi military fiction. So this, this takes place in the Warhammer 40 K universe, but this is not about Warhammer. This is, it happens in the universe. Yeah. This is military fiction. This is about regular people. Okay. This is uh this is a series called Gaunt's Ghosts. It's about a uh, a military an army regiment. Mm-hmm. Uh they're you know called the Imperial Guard, but they're just army men yeah. with gu- guys with rifles uh and they're and it, power armor? It, no, no, no. These are just guys. They don't even wear armor. They're they're a scout troop. Okay. So they're like sneaky dudes with uh with like camo cloaks and a and a laser rifle, but Okay. So yeah, this is really military fiction too. To boil it down as Warhammer 40K would be, I would say, to cheapen it. Okay. Because this is extremely good. Like, if you like Starship Troopers or anything along that line or Sharps Rifles by Bernard Cornwell, which hmm. a his, which is a historical military fiction okay. uh, that is really, really well regarded, uh, Gaunt's Ghosts by Dan Abnett is definitely for you. That's um, an author you've mentioned. Before, yeah. I, I've, list, I've read several of his books. He's... Mm-hmm. He's, he's a prolific writer. He he is like he can put out like a novel a year, and they're good. Uh, so basically, this is a a, a, a sixteen novel series. It's like a, this is like a, a yeah, like a um, what do you call it? The An epic. Yeah, it's like a, a continuous saga. series. This is this is like a. Um, a continuing thing most of them are chronological occasionally there'll be like a remembrance thing that goes mm-hmm. back this is like dresden files okay um but this is about a military unit that's led by this uh fellow named ibram gaunt who is uh a colonel commissar which is basically like he's a, a morale uh political officer and mm-hmm. a colonel and this is about him and his men and the crazy shit they get sent to do. So it, it really jives more with Alien, mm-hmm. how there's, you know, like these uh, military guys mm-hmm. uh, in space fighting bad guys, fighting aliens. Mm-hmm. And uh, But the thing you actually care about, just like in those movies, you care about the people and the relationships that the people have with each yeah. other. It's just like that. Um, and it's just super well done uh so if you've if you like military fiction or you you're not sure if you would like something set in this universe uh like at the idea of space marines or whatever is off-putting gaunt's ghosts is really really relatable they're very very regular people who are hmm. forced into this situation and it's pretty cool are you just you're recommending the first book in the series uh, i would recommend I mean, yeah, you should start with the first one. Okay. Uh, it's just called First and Only. Um, and uh, the whole series is great. So okay. if you just if you just Google Gaunt's Ghosts, uh, mm-hmm. it'll be it'll come up and it's a whole series. There's a bunch of books and uh, it's, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, even if you're only interested in one, they're uh, only interested in checking it out. Like they're a military unit that was uh, conscripted from a planet that is basically kind of a a Celtic-ish 
culture. They're they're like kind of an, uh, like a Northern Irish style, hmm. very very working class people, and they come from a heavily wooded planet. And th- it starts off. They've got this foreign officer who's been put in control of their first battalion, okay. and all of a sudden their planet is being invaded, and ultimately. It gets destroyed. Uh, this is not a spoiler. It's kind of the foundation of their unit mm-hmm. because there was supposed to be three Tanith regiments. And so that's why it's called First and Only mm. because they're the first Tanith regiment and only Tanith regiment. Okay. And everyone else dies. They're the last remainder of the population of their planet. That's why they're called ghosts. They're the echoes of their dead people. Very cool. And so it's a super cool novel series. Were they attacked by Tyranids? Because that would be very thematically they were alien. actually attacked by chaos i wish it was okay. tyrannies but yeah, yeah was, that would just uh, yeah. that would just jive just a little bit better <laughs> yeah i think the tyrannies would have done a better job <laughs> <laughs> of eliminating them. yeah they would have got them they wouldn't have escaped okay all right so what about you what are you pulling out of the um, vault i've got one one official thing that i'm tying to to this movie and then right. one thing that i uh similarly an audible book that i had listened to oh yeah um that I, I want to mention, but it doesn't have anything to do with, with Alien. Um, so the first thing is, uh, Danny McBride was in a few years ago, in a, or 10 years ago, excuse me, a horror comedy with a bunch of his buddies called This Is The End. Oh, God, yeah, that movie's um, so funny. Yeah, which the synopsis is, six Los Angeles celebrities are stuck in James Franco's house after a, serious, a series of devastating events just destroyed the city. Inside, the group not only have to face the apocalypse, but themselves. So <laughs> it's a post-apocalyptic horror comedy um, w- that's also a metaphor about the way that friendships grow and change over time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very funny. It's very uh, obscene and and over the top. Uh, the devil hangs dong in, oh, in they, this movie. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's just a lot of a lot of fun. And it's a, a Danny McBride is a, uh, as always gives a show stealing performance. Absolutely, uh, he kind of disappears for a big portion of the movie and then comes back as a as a Mad Max like sort a of writer. Yeah. Yeah. And um was it Channing Tatum Gimp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's uh this is the end is a, is a lot of fun. It's another good uh I was trying to find another Danny McBride vehicle that I oh, could man, tie to that, this. That is, I I love all of his stuff, but of his movies, uh-huh. man, that one makes me just bust up yeah. laughing. It was the most like thematically appropriate because it is a, it it's has a, real horror stuff in it, oh, like yeah, demonic absolutely. possession and and all sorts of stuff. Now so, I want to go watch that yeah. movie. So this is the end uh, from 2013. And then just recently, I finished uh, Into the Void from Birth to Black Sabbath and Beyond, Geezer Butler's memoir. Oh. Um, it, uh, I listened to it on Audible. It just recently was released in paperback. The hardcover's been out for a while. Um, I'm a huge Black Sabbath fan, uh, both the original Ozzy Osbourne era and then the, the later Dio stuff. Um, I haven't listened to the the non Aussie non Dio albums, but mm. I'm sure there's some gems in that in that stuff too. Um, it's a real tell all. Uh, you know, I think he's gentle with some people's feelings, but he he shares a lot of the the, the ugly sides of the of that the band's history. Uh, it's no secret all of them had addiction problems over the years. Yeah, uh, and a lot of there's been a lot of. Uh, wounded feelings back and forth in that band uh but they're mostly on good terms now uh and he narrates the audiobook himself which is always my preference oh that's so good so it's in his nice charming brahmi accent uh that sort of way people was at the north midlands i don't it's the what do you call that part of england yeah i have no idea it's a it's a particular sort of way they droll their delivery out it's very uh dry deadpan um, and I just found it really charming um, and thoroughly enjoyed it. And it made me listen to the Black Sabbath 1992 album Dehumanizer, which I'd never listened to oh. before because uh, he talks so fondly about it. And uh, that movie rip or that that album rips. It's really good. <laughs> Who's the vocalist? That's on when that? D, that's when it's when Geezer rejoined the band and when Dio rejoined the band oh. after it had been essentially a Tony Iommi solo project for several albums. Geezer is the most interesting guy in that band. 
He's a he's a far out cat. Like he, he has uh, prophetic visions. Yeah, that play a big part in his life. He's been uh, a vegetarian since before he knew the word for it, um, which was challenging in the 1960s to be yeah, a vegetarian yeah. in England. Um, so that plays a big part in his story, and it's just he's a really interesting dude. And um, he was on Mark Maron's WTF podcast the other day. And I was like, you know what? I need to give that book a chance because it's been in my, you would probably like suggestions on Audible forever um, because it is totally the kind of book that I, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so definitely Into the Void by Geezer Butler. Check that one out. I will definitely have to check that one out. Cool. Well, we'd like to thank you for joining the Nightshade Cult until we.